Hello PennDOT Community Traffic Safety Partners. Thank you for joining us for another video which is being produced for you by the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Center for Injury Research and Prevention. In this video, Chapter 12b, we'll finish our discussion of quantitative data collection for your program evaluation, addressing the different delivery methods that are available to you for your survey research, paper pencil surveys versus online surveys and automatic response systems. We'll discuss how you can improve your response rates and also how to get started with the analysis process and reporting your results. Paper pencil surveys can be delivered either in person or mailed and are very desirable for many because they're simple to complete. They're ideal for in-person workshops or programs because they can ensure that they're completed and submitted since we can deliver them to our participants before and after our program experience. Often we have a lower response rate by mail, and these can be more time consuming for you because they require you to do data entry before you can do your data analysis. But we can improve our response rates for our mail surveys by making sure that we do follow up reminder phone calls, gently reminding people and asking them to kindly complete our survey by a given deadline. Online surveys are now easier than ever and less expensive than they used to be thanks to applications like SurveyMonkey and Google Forms, which are both free and user-friendly. These are also simple to complete and ideal for target audiences that are typically on their computers anyway. Thanks to these survey programs, they're also less time-consuming than paper pencil surveys when it comes to data analysis because we don't have to enter any data since it's automatically tracked by the program as it comes in. This also helps to avoid any data entry errors that might happen from you. We can improve our response rates for our online surveys by sending gentle reminders through follow-up emails to prompt people and making a clear deadline for completion in our emails. We can also use radio buttons like these instead of drop-down menu items for answer choices, which increase the likelihood that somebody will complete every question that we ask them and not accidentally miss one of the questions in our surveys. An automatic response system is a type of survey that we can do during our experience. An ARS, as it's called, combines wireless hardware with presentation software to create interactive learning experiences. Turning technology software is installed on your computer and becomes a part of your PowerPoint toolbar. Since each person in your audience is given a wireless remote, they can use it to select answers to your survey throughout your presentation. This allows your presentation to update in real time, displaying your audience responses in a graph. The benefits of using an ARS is that it allows you to simultaneously engage your audience while also collecting quantitative data from them at your presentation. It helps you to customize and personalize your instruction because you can change the delivery method and discuss what you're saying a little bit differently based on the feedback that you get for your, from your audience. It also compiles the data as you're going through your presentation so that at the end, all of your data is presented to you in an Excel spreadsheet for your use at a later date. You can learn more about how to use an ARS by visiting the websites for Turning Technologies, where they have free online public classes and a training page. And since PennDOT already subscribes to Turning Technologies and ARS software and systems, if you're interested in using ARS for your programs, please contact your local PennDOT representatives so that they can help assist you with getting started. So what does the ARS look like in practice? Well, a recent interview with some PennDOT folks who've used ARS for their presentations gave us some really helpful feedback to not only let us know how easy it is, but also how valuable it is. Let's hear what they have to say. My thought is it's a very easy software to work with, and it is software-based. <laughs> You know, it, the software drives the system, um, and when we had any questions, their tech support people were incredibly good. Did you think that the ARS was a good addition to the current program that you used it for? Oh my gosh, oh, yes. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, any, you know, currently our, our presentations that we're doing out in the, out in the community, uh, they're either very interactive where, you know, we're outside or we're doing games and activities with our audience, or they are like a PowerPoint. And although we try to make them interactive, we're doing different games, 
you know, you're talking about doing games where you give, you know, split your groups up into teams and give them a noise maker, and, you know, to, to do that. So this system provides that interactive element where every single person can be engaged in what's going on. And they all feel and they, and they all know that their answer is being counted and that they're having an impact on, you know, the overall presentation and the, the data collection, uh, even if they're just kids. You know, they, they get excited to see the graph bars go up on the screen. So I think it's absolutely an effective presentation tool. We hope that listening to just that brief clip will inspire you to consider using the ARS for improving your own programs and for helping you to simultaneously evaluate how well your programs are doing. Now that you've collected your data, how can you start thinking about analyzing your findings and reporting your quantitative findings for your program evaluation? There are a few key points to keep in mind. First, anytime we collect our quantitative information, we want to make sure we aggregate our results. It's not really helpful to talk about how just one or two people feel about our program, so we want to make sure that we're talking about all of our feedback in aggregate, and we're typically using percentages, rates, or expressing this information by category. We might also report our quantitative findings by theme or by question block in our survey, or to analyze trends over time, or the difference between our pre-surveys and our post-surveys. And certainly, whenever possible, if you have quantitative findings, take advantage of graphs, tables, and bar charts to make them visually appealing and easier to understand. It's also important to recognize our limitations when we report our quantitative findings. Certainly, we all have limited sample sizes, and our information might be taken at one point in time, so it's not necessarily representative of the population at large. There's also inherent self-report bias when reporting quantitative information because people often share in a survey what they want us to, to believe that they understand rather than what they actually feel or what they actually know. And it's possible that your numbers and your close-ended responses are going to lack depth, and certainly they're not going to have much explanation. So you may choose to do some follow-up interviews or focus groups in order to expand on the information that you've gotten from your quantitative data collection. To see what this looks like in practice, look at the resource book for an example of a write-up of quantitative findings. You have just completed Chapter 12b, Quantitative Data Collection, Delivery, Analysis, and Reporting. In our next chapter, Chapter 13, we'll get started with talking about qualitative data collection so that you can have additional tools in your toolkit for your program evaluation. Thank you for watching.